if our families have any hope, people must know Jesus. This is what we must experience. The time is coming on this earth where you will have to stand. Days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us the warning is given. Take heed to yourselves. Father in heaven, it is a miracle that we have made it back to another night to worship, to study, to learn more of your principles. And we want to thank you for working out the situations in our lives and allowing us to be present tonight. And even beyond your protecting us and assisting us to make it here, thank you for not allowing us to receive the wages of our sins. Forgive us for sinning against you. Forgive us, Lord, for not being sensitive to your love and how we bring you pain when we rebel. Help us to cooperate with you. Tonight we pray that your Holy Spirit would so fill this room that again our hearts would be overcharged with the desire to study your word, the desire to teach others about you, and above all, the desire to be saved. Help us, Lord. Tonight, speak through your manservant. Give me clarity of mind, clear words. Bind every unclean spirit from distracting this room. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible says in James chapter 2, I just want to somewhat pick up on a couple of things that we spoke about already. James chapter 2. Beginning with verse 19, James chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. The Bible says, Heavenly Father, anoint our minds so that we can appreciate and develop as we read these sacred writings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In verse 19, the Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe, and what? And tremble. The devils also believe and tremble. And that was the verse that didn't quite come to my mind the other night. But had it come to my mind the other night, maybe the Lord would not have been able to guide my mind in the direction that He wanted me to go in this night. I think it's very important for us to understand if we're going to make it in this final warfare that every human is involved in, whether or not they fight or whether or not they just surrender. We must really understand 
not only what has been paid for us, but also what we have available to cooperate and for our usage so that we cannot fail. Why it is that we will be excuseless. First of all, I want to repeat something. I want to repeat it until you are convinced to go home and to pray about it. I want to repeat it night after night until you are convinced that you cannot live without the understanding of it. Until it becomes crystal clear because if the Bible says strong statements such as the wages of sin is death, if the Bible makes statements such as God will in no wise excuse the sinner, if the Bible leaves us utterly hopeless unless we fear God and keep all His commandments, and then the Bible makes it even clearer. As a matter of fact, go with me to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And notice what the Bible says. I want to take my time tonight and I hope, hopefully can make it extremely clear what it is that God requires and why it is that the requirements are reachable, but they're out of our reach at the same time. As a matter of fact, that would have been a good title tonight. Reachable, but out of reach. But brothers and sisters, if God would use language such as this in Ecclesiastes 12, beginning with verse 13. As a matter of fact, it's interesting when you read verse 12. The Bible says, if we're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says in verse 12 of Ecclesiastes, And further, by these my son... Now remember, this is the wise man. This is supposed to be the wisest man that ever lived, writing these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are such solemn and sacred times. Not only the times that we're living in in earth's history, but when we come into the presence of the Almighty God. If we really believe, as the prophet tells us, that when the man of God stands in the desk, it is not his words that he chooses, nor is it his thoughts that he gives, but the oracles of God, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit humbling himself speaking to the mind of a man and communicating those words to you, or in more simplistic terms, if you really believe that it is the voice of the living God, then how dare you speak while God is speaking to us? We're talking about the Creator, brothers and sisters. And if we truly come here to really hear, and if you don't believe that it's the voice of God, then you would be considered a fool to come and listen. I would never sit under the inspiration of any minister if I believe that he is deliberately telling me a lie or if I don't believe that he is guided by God. I see people that come to these meetings, especially on Saturday nights, they show up. And I have the, the, the limited amount of information to know that they attend churches where their ministers have compromised the message of God and speak not by the authority of God, but by the breathing of Satan himself. And yet they go week after week and they rationalize in their minds. But brothers and sisters, it's a dangerous thing in these hours. We have enough of the devil blurting in and out of our ears, don't we? We have enough foolish trash just coming from every direction, whether we want to hear it or not in the grocery stores. Even the post office has music now. The devil doesn't want a moment of our time to be in silence where we can reflect and hear the voice of the living God. And so when we come in here, we should cherish these moments of quietness where the Spirit of God can speak and shape our thoughts and our minds so that we will learn how to abide in Christ and have eternal life. So please, please, even when you bring visitors, you tell them, you know, some people say, you know, I'm used to shouting and I'm used to jumping and I'm used to dancing. Well, you know, that's all right. Do it when you have your private devotion. Now, that made you think, didn't it? Isn't it interesting that when people get up at 3, 4, 5 in the morning to study their Bibles on their own or when they kneel down to pray by themselves at home, they don't start shouting and jumping around and dancing? 
Why is it that they would have an experience with a bunch of people that will be dearer than a personal experience with God himself? So please, I beg you on behalf of everyone in here who desires to be saved and really believes that they need to hear the voice of God prior to leaving this place to reverence this place. The Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. Keep silent. When we look at the standards that God has placed on us, there are standards that are unreachable yet reachable. The Bible here clearly says in Ecclesiastes 12, beginning with verse 13, this wise man says, uh, beginning with verse 12, he says, And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. In other words, the wise man wrote, People always write books about God. People always write books about the standards of God and how to, and, and they will elaborate on the things of God. He said, you know, these books will keep being written. He said, but let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Listen to what he says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Read the rest with me, won't you? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the what? The word whole means this is the complete responsibility of man. He says, yes, there's volumes and volumes of commentaries. Books and books and books and, and, and thesis and, and all types of papers written about God. He says, but you know, if you couldn't get to any of those, let me give you the conclusion of the whole matter or, or the completeness of the whole thing. Fear God. In other words, reverence God. We don't run around shaking. God doesn't use those type of tactics. He doesn't want us to be afraid of him, afraid to approach him. No, fear means reverence. Reverence God. Respect God. Humble yourself before God and keep his commandments. This is the entire complete responsibility for mankind. For God will bring every work into the judgment, even the secret things. So he says, please, fear him, reverence him, and keep his commandments. And then the Bible turns and shows us clearly that we can't do that. Romans chapter 8, Romans 8 says very clearly, one of my favorite passages, and I often remind myself of this, especially when I fail, because when you fail, you automatically recognize that you are not in Christ. When you fail, you recognize that you are not in Christ. Notice what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 says very clearly, beginning with verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. Here God is saying to, to have your natural mind is death. Carnal mind is our natural mind. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, because the carnal mind or the natural mind or the mind that is absent from God, and remember, the carnal mind does not join with God. You don't get to the point where the, it, 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 is not, it is not humanity. Plus divinity, speaking of your humanity, no, 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 no. It is not the carnal mind, which the word carnal means absent from spiritual. It is not as though God can tap into your brain and bring divine principles. It is not that he can do anything with your mind except kill it. Because it says the carnal mind hates God. That word enmity hates God. And it's not subject. That's what it says. Read it with me a moment, brothers and sisters. We need to really understand this. The Bible says, because the carnal mind is enmity or hatred against God. Now, one of the questions that came up tonight, the quiz man asked, he says, the King James Version of the Bible says, to confess your sins one to another. Brothers and sisters, you may see a different wording in your Bible if you don't have a King James Version. And if you don't have a King James Version, you need to get one. 
these other Bibles in the name of simplifying the gospel has slipped little, little scripture texts in that will cause you to be destroyed in the end, that will cause you to be absent from the truth. And we read James chapter 5, and if you have a Bible, if you have a Bible that is not a King James Version, go to James chapter 5 real quickly. This is very important. James chapter 5. If you have a Bible that is not a King James Version, and if you have a King James Version, go on and go to it. Go to James chapter 5. And notice what it says in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I plead for a special anointing so that we will follow you every day, every night, every moment after our experience with you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Notice what it says in James chapter 5. Are we there? James 5, beginning with verse 16. Very crucial text. Very important text. James 5. James 5, beginning with verse 16. James 5, beginning with verse 16. Notice what it says. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a King James Ver Version Bible, would you stand up with it? Just stand up with it with me. Don't, don't be ashamed. Just stand up. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Amen. Amen. Please stand up. If you don't have one, just stand up. Now, watch what it says. I want you to notice what it says. Verse 16 says, confess your what? Your what? Now, I ain't asking any of you sitting down. I'm not asking you a King James Version. Trespasses. And what does someone else say? Sins. Trespasses and sins are the same thing. Now, what I'd like you to do is turn around and start telling us all your sins. Huh? Whoa, come on now. Look, one lady went to sit down. Don't you sit down. You tell me your sins. Go on, please be seated. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, that, that, that's pretty dangerous, isn't it? Now, we do recognize that a lot of our, 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 our dear Catholic friends, and I have some dear Catholic friends, sincere Christians, they go to confessionals. And they confess their sins to the priest. But brothers and sisters, the Bible says that I need to go to Jesus and confess. Now, in the King James Version, it says confess your faults. And it's a difference. It's a difference. If you look in Mark chapter 9 in your Bible, let me just go there. The Holy Spirit led at this time. Let's go there. Mark chapter 9 in your Bible. Notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 9. The Bible says very clearly in Mark 9, after Jesus had cast out a demon of a little boy, in Mark chapter 9, the Bible says, beginning with verse 29, it's very important. You see, the King James Version was written on a 6th and 7th grade level. The New International was written on a 10th and 11th grade level. It's not easier to understand. The Bible says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things back to your remembrance. God wants us to learn by the Holy Spirit, not try to rewrite and simplify it to come down to a man's level. If you notice in Mark chapter 9, listen to what the Bible says in Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 29. The Bible says, and he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but what? Prayer and fasting. Now, those new international versions or those new versions, they don't say prayer and fasting. They leave fasting out. Now, Jesus said prayer and fasting. Why would they leave fasting out? Let me give you one more text, and let me tell you, there are hundreds of texts. As a matter of fact, if you're interested, I'll get you a book with, 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 with over 500 changes if you're interested. But let me give you one right here. Go with me to Luke chapter 2. You just sign up at the bookstore tonight where the tapes are sold right outside the door. If you're interested, you sign up. I'll order the book for you, and I'll make sure you get it at a price much cheaper than anybody else will sell it to you for. I'm not here trying to get rich, brothers and sisters. So anything that we make available will save you money. Amen. Notice what it says here. If you're there in Luke 2, let me hear you say amen. This is a crucial text here. Notice what it says in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 33. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. 
Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 33. The Bible says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of them. Now these new versions says, And his mother and father. Joseph was not Jesus' father. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. Joseph had never touched Mary. It is blasphemy to put that the child's father and mother. It's clear. The King James Version clearly wrote, and Joseph and his mother. And even though people will say, well, King James was a drunk, King James did not translate this Bible. King James was sick and tired of everybody giving their opinions of Scripture. And so what he did is he took his wealth and he hired uh, so many scholars and he planted them all, all, all over uh, the European nations and, and he had all of them translated and bring it together. They weren't even in the same room. And that's how we came up with this version. And some people say, well, you know, there are a whole lot of changes there too. The changes that were made when people talk about the changes in the King James Version is like changes that where a U and a V were the same. They changed it so that we could see the difference in a U and a V because of modern English words and letters. And it's more and more history, but the bottom line is we need to teach from the one that is clearest and the safest today, and that's this one. Have you noticed how that New International Version has overtaken all of them? I'm going to tell you who brought that Bible out. That's a new Bible. That's not an old Bible, brothers and sisters. So here the Bible says that the carnal mind hates God. Then it says it's not subject to the law of God. And then it says neither indeed can be. And so God is not talking about your mind and his mind. He's not talking about that. God is talking about the mind of Christ. Christ is still a human. Did you know that? Jesus Christ in heaven right now, in the most holy place, interceding for you and me is a human. When he took on humanity, brothers and sisters, he married it for life. Even now he bears the wounds that are in his hands and his feet and in his side and on his head, he bears those wounds right now as our high priest. He's there. That's why the Bible says that he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He represents us. So his human mind that gained the victory over every sin in thought and deed, he never failed. His mind is now ready to come into our heads. So we surrender to Christ. We give Christ our hearts. And at that time, our minds and our ways and our thoughts are dead. It's called being dead to the flesh. His mind, his mind is a holy mind. When he went to the Father, remember when he told Mary, Mary, don't touch me yet in John chapter 21. Don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. When he went to the Father and the Father examined and saw that he lived on this earth perfectly without sin, and then the Holy Ghost examined and saw that he lived on this earth perfectly without sin, and then God the Son even agreed. These three witnesses then glorified him. His humanity is now glorified humanity. And now his humanity bridges the gap between earth and heaven. And now we can be one with God because of him. Now we can approach God. We can stand in the most holy place. We have an advocate with the Father. Before, we didn't have an advocate. Why? Because an angel couldn't stand before the Father for us. Because he too was a created being. Before, we had no advocate. But Jesus said, prepare me a body. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. And Jesus came so that now we have an earthly representative. Do you remember in the book of Job chapter 1? We didn't have anyone to represent us. Notice what it says in Job chapter 1. Job, what chapter are we going to? 
Job chapter 1. Listen, brothers and sisters, we can win this fight. Why? Because not only do we have an advocate, but we have the King of kings and the Lord of lords on our side. Too often, we act defenseless and hopeless when we have all this on our side. Notice what the Bible says in Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Just before the book of Psalms, the book of Job chapter 1. The Bible says, beginning with verse 6, Job 1, beginning with verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence camest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and ensureth evil. In other words, these sons of God, these leaders of God, these angels of God, these created beings of God came from all other worlds. There are other worlds sophisticated and beautiful that we have never seen. They did not partake from the tree of evil like we partook of it. And so when these sons of God came to present themselves before God, earth didn't have a representative. For even though Job had surrendered his life and lived a victorious life in the presence of the, Holy, uh, of the Holy Father by the power of the Holy Spirit, Job was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and had confessed sin. He had to offer sacrifices because of his sin, and he was not good enough to represent us in heaven. Therefore, he was right here, and the devil tried to represent us. Why? Because the majority of the people seemed to give him homage. And Jesus said, wait a minute. You a sinner, Satan. You don't have a redeemer. You gave up your chances. You know, Satan, Satan tried to get back in heaven. The prophet of the Lord said that the Spirit of God took her into a vision, and she saw Satan, and he was sitting there contemplating contemplating his position now that he had been cast out of heaven. And he saw an angel, and he begged the angel to come, and the angel came, and he said, go and tell Jesus to come here. And the angel went and got Christ, and Christ came. And Satan said, look, I'm sorry. Can I come back? Please. He begged to be reinstated to heaven. And Jesus wept at his woe. Jesus cried not because he couldn't come back, but he wept at his condition. He wept because here was someone that he loved. Here is, I, I, and I'm not saying loved past tense. I'm saying he loved him right then. Jesus despises and hates everything the devil has ever done, but he does not hate and despise Satan himself. It's his son. He created him. His desire was to live with him forever. And the pain that hit his heart when he saw the condition a condition that even he couldn't help. He wept at his woe when he had to tell him, no, you can never enter in again. Do you know how he's going to feel, brothers and sisters, if he has to tell us that one day? It's going to break his heart if he has to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. I never had a marriage with you. When the Bible says, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, it's talking about intercourse. It's talking about a oneness. It's talking about a sanctity that lasts forever. You never allowed Christ to become one with you. And he said, I never knew you. Oh, yeah, you talked about getting married. You showed up at the wedding, but you never consummated it with me. And so the Bible says that our carnal minds, it's impossible for us to reach the standard. When the writer wrote, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, God was telling man there is a duty that you must perform that you are incapable of performing by yourself. Therefore, you must turn to the human, the human Christ Jesus. And not only will the humanity of Christ come down into your mind, but the divinity of Christ will also glorify your mind where you are now capable of performing anything but it is not you it is the power of God doing it through you with this alone how can we fail why is it that so many of us 
don't have everything that we want that he desires for us. And I'm not talking about earthly things that will one day perish. That's all right. Nice things are fine. But I'm talking about health and strength and moral fiber. Jesus says, I will do it for you because I have done it for you already. Let me do it through you now. And so, brothers and sisters, when we contemplate this, we look now and we say, wait a minute. We're talking about God. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, the Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. And remember, we talked about it that night. I'm reviewing for those who are here for the first time. It says, baptize them in the name, and it says, name, singular, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now notice, brothers and sisters, when it said in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, it's acknowledging that God, the Son, or Jesus, is also God. And so we have the Son as a human, as we know it, who conquered sin, and then we have God, the divinity, who has never sinned, but created all of us, the Creator, who knows how to come in to the flesh that he created and live a victorious, perfect life through you. This is what the Son, Jesus Christ, can do for you. But he needs your permission. He needs your choice. He will not force you at any point. And if you read that handout I gave you on the power of influence, if you remember, it said that often, it's not the handout you have right now, it said that often, if you would educate your mind to focus on the Son, Jesus Christ, high and lifted up, if you would educate your mind to think on the things of God and constantly ask God to suppress the power of your own will, your own will is dangerous. Your own will loves death, looks for death, searches for death. Your own will will cause pain. If you will surrender to God the things of the flesh, if you would do this, then, brothers and sisters, at that time, you have operating in you the power of the Creator who can recreate in you every experience that He had on earth. I'm talking about victories now. He will recreate in you the victories. And I said recreate. He doesn't do any new thing. It's what He's already done. He does it in you. But you have to give Him permission. How does it work? You say, first of all, you say tonight, Lord, I want to surrender. I want to surrender my heart to you. When you say you want to surrender, you're outside. You're in the world. This is me, Stephen. He's in the world. He's sinning. Now that he's sinning, he says, Lord, please help me. Christ snatches you from here inside his circle of safety. And his circle of safety, the Bible calls in Christ. Something supernatural takes place the minute you surrender. God swoops down fast. He doesn't wait. He doesn't hesitate. The only thing that messes you up is you keep thinking on it rather than praising him for it. And praise is not how loud you can shout. Praise is not how good you can do the holy dance. Praise is not how good you can play the drums. Praise, the highest form, is living an obedient life to Christ. That's how you're praising. The Bible said it doesn't matter how you talk and how you sing. How do you live? So what happens is, the supernatural thing that takes place is, you are brought into Christ. Once you are brought into Christ, the same things that the Holy Spirit examined when Jesus went to heaven after his, resurrected, after his resurrection, and when the Holy Spirit examined to see that he was perfect, the same thing the Father saw after he examined it is now in you. Now, when the Father looks at you, you appear in the courts of heaven as though you lived a perfect life from the day you were born forward. Nothing that you've done shows up. The Bible says old things are passed away. Now, the Bible talks about a covering of sins. 
a covering of sins. And then it talks about the blotting out of sins. You'll find these terms in the Bible. A covering of sins and a blotting out of sins. When tonight, when you say to the Lord, Lord, I want to be in Christ because I recognize that my carnal mind or my natural mind hates you. Now you may say, wait a minute. I don't hate God. I mean, I sin, but I don't hate God. Now, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The Bible says that Christ died the most brutal death because of sin. The Bible says anyone who participated in sin is the cause of Jesus going to the cross. When Pilate said, crucify him. That wasn't Pilate that said that today when you sinned. The same way when you surrender to God, the Father sees Jesus as you stand before him. When you sin, God doesn't see Pilate. He sees you saying, crucify him. Crucify him. You say, I don't hate him. Well, how could you beat someone until their back is opened up to where you can see the bone? How can you spit in someone's face? How can you snatch hair out of his beard? How can you mat up a crown of thorns and jam it on his head because so, and, and, and to pain and blood comes out of his temples and say you don't hate him? That's what sin does. Sin killed that lamb. That's why he died, because of sin. And so, brothers and sisters, we say to God, I hate God, and I want to love him. So I want to surrender because my carnal mind, my carnal mind is incapable. The minute you say that, you come into Christ. At that point, you are covered. At that point, you are covered. If you died right then, you would experience what was called the blotting out. But if you should live under the covering, now you move into a relationship with God. Your humanity has a role to play, and the role that your humanity plays now is that of an agreer. An agree agreement or an agreer. You agree with God now. In other words, now when you are covered, there are things in your life and I'm just putting numbers here that don't represent anything specifically, but anything in your life that you would do if you were outside of Christ. Anything. At this point, Jesus, his mind is in control. Now, if your mind, follow me, brothers and sisters, if your mind is dead, If your mind is dead, get this now, if your mind is dead, can Satan talk anymore to you? I want you to think about this. If your mind is dead, can Satan speak to the dead? Does the devil have the power to speak to the dead? Go with me to the book of John, chapter 11. Follow me, brothers and sisters. We're talking about victory tonight. Victory in Christ Jesus. This is our only hope, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says in John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11. The question that's on the table tonight is if I surrender to God, can Satan speak to me anymore? Can the devil tempt me anymore? Because remember, <clears throat> upon surrender, we found that when the soul surrenders itself to God, a new power takes possession of the new heart. <clears throat> so in other words, you get a new mind when you surrender to God. And whose mind do you get? You get the mind of Christ. His human mind now connects with your mind and his divine mind comes into your body. Now, your mind or your flesh is dead. You have surrendered. Can Satan speak to the dead? Notice what the Bible says in John chapter 11, beginning with verse, beginning with verse 
uh, 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 24, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto him, what? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were what? Dead, yet shall he what? Shall he live? Now notice what it says, brothers and sisters. Notice what it goes on to say. The Bible says in verse 35, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. No, he was crying because of them, brothers and sisters. He was crying because he had been with them so long, and they still didn't know him. And then it says in verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He didn't go to heaven. He's in there stinking, for he has been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou should have seen the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, because, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, What? Lazarus, what? Come forth. And what happened? You guys looking around, look in the Bible. What happened? What did it say? And he that was dead did what? The devil can't speak to the dead. Only Jesus can speak to the dead. Jesus is the only one that has the power of the resurrection. So if you are dead in Christ, then Satan can't talk to you anymore. Well, wait a minute. I'm in love with sports. I can sit and watch a basketball, football, or baseball game for hours. I know all the players. I know the stats. But I don't study my Bible the way I can watch that. And I'm not as excited. Which one is your God? So now what happens? Before the next game comes on, Jesus is the only one that can speak to the dead. So now Jesus speaks to your dead flesh and says to you, my child, I am not in boxing. Can you imagine me being in the ring or even sitting around a boxing ring watching two men beat each other? and destroy the very humanity that I created? Do you see me on a football field tackling, not only trying to stop the runner, but I'm trying to hurt him? Can you see me doing that? Do you see me involved in competition where you would use all your energy to cause another man to fail so that you could win? No. Jesus does everything so that you can win, not fail. God isn't in. You say, oh, but, but it's exercise. It teaches discipline. Listen, you get up and walk a couple of miles every day. That's exercise. And if you do it every day, that's discipline also. Good sportsmanship has room for a loser and a winner. With Christ, the loser goes to hell. There's no room to lose. We don't ever need to practice losing. Brothers and sisters, we need to always be a part of his winnings. And so Christ says to us, okay, you know what? Before you smoke again or before you boot up that, 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 that uh, internet for some porn, Christ comes to you because you're living but you're covered. It's not blotted out. So Christ comes to you and he says, will you accept my victory over and whatever the sin is Christ communicates now with the dead you say yes yes Lord and when you say yes you settle into Christ a little further his hold is a little tighter you know we used to play a game called tug of war 
they used to fill up a ditch with a bunch of mud. And, and it was all muddy and nasty. And, and, and we would have teams on each side. And everybody would grab the rope. And you'd pull. And you'd pull. And sometimes you'd have to get a little grip and get it tighter. And tighter to where you could lock in. And, and, and they lose their hold. And everybody on that other side is coming into the mud. When you say yes to Christ in agreement to him, not dialogue with him. We're not dialoguing with God. When Jesus says, will you accept my victory over homosexuality, you are to say yes. You're not to think about how much you enjoy. You're not to think about how long you've been doing it. You're not to think about how the tar and nicotine has now taken part in your flesh and it actually craves for the cigarette. You are not to think about that man and how you love him and, and, and how you don't know how. Oh, but what other woman will he be with? You're not to think about any of that. You're to think about answering the question, Will you accept my victory? Yes. And once you say yes, Jesus tightens up on the rope. The devil will come back to Jesus. He can't communicate with you. He'll say, no, nah, I know he wants this. Jesus will tell you, will you accept my victory? You'll say yes. He'll tighten up on the rope. Will you accept my victory? Yes. He'll tighten up on the rope. And Christ will literally, Christ will go through your entire mind while it is dead while it is what brothers and sisters while it is dead he will go through everything even things you don't realize and he'll yes 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 and as you keep saying yes see he'll wake you up in the morning and through his mind you'll study the scriptures your brain will open up his human, his perfect humanity will study those scriptures through your body. He will wake you up when you're tired. You'll get up anyway. He'll say, son, will you get up and sleep? Will you accept my study habits? Yes, that means he studied sometimes all night. Will you accept my, will you accept my, 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 uh, my, my, my eating habits? Yes. And the more you keep saying yes, the more he gets a tighter grip. It gets to a point where you get down to where there's nothing left. There's nothing left. Nothing left for the devil to tempt you on. You have agreed with God on every single point. You hear me? Everything that the devil has thrown at Jesus about you, you have said yes to Christ about everything. And now, the rope is at that end, where now the devil's coming in the mud. He's being baptized with all your sins. And one day, it will be with fire. And we call this, in some Christian terms, the sealing. The sealing or settling. Settling into Christ, where now, nothing that comes at you when you get to that point, you experience, you experience at that point, not the covering, but the blotting. The blotting out. In other words, when you get to the point where there's nothing that Satan can get you to do, and you have talked to Christ about everything, and you have said yes, then everything is blotted out. The life of Christ stands forever with you. Now, during the process, during the process, if you say no, the moment you say no, Christ allows your flesh to be resurrected. He backs out. You are no longer in Christ. You are now on your own. Many of you have experienced that. Christ will say to you, you know that the relationship you are in is ungodly, Will you accept my victory? Will you cut it off? And you say, well, Lord, I really love him. The minute you start dialoguing, you're out here on your own. You said no. You say, wait a minute. When do I dialogue? After you say yes. In other words, if Christ says, will you give this thing up? You say yes. Then after you say yes, then you say, Lord, there's a power that is working right now making me believe that I want this thing. But you gave me a new mind. I need you to help me. 
Or you may not understand. You may say, well, Lord, yes, I, I'll take it. And you may say, well, Lord, what's wrong with it, though? After you've said yes, you first agree with the king in the matter. Why? Because in the king's presence, you don't have any rights. You don't have any rights when you say, let this mind be in me. Can you imagine? That's what the devil wanted. The devil wanted to control the mind of Christ. That's what he wanted in heaven. He wanted to control the mind of Christ. That was the whole, that's where the whole spirit of competition came from. Satan competing for the throne of God itself. And so we don't compete, we don't challenge, we don't try to control the mind of Christ. Remember, his mind not only has the human aspect, but it has the divine aspect. His humanity did not create us. It came and identified with us. His divinity created us. So the creator knows what is best for that which he created. You don't have a Mercedes-Benz mechanic come to a Lexus dealer to work out a problem. Nor does he go to a Volvo. Did you know that BMW, Jaguar, Volvo, Lexus, Mercedes-Benz, Chevrolet, they all have their mechanics university where you go and you get certified to work on that particular car. And they teach you the ins and the outs. And, 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 and now technology has it where they can hook your car up on what they used to call a brain. And it's nothing but a computer. And, and you turn the car on and, and it'll, it'll spit out anything wrong with the car. Now if you take the Chevy and hook it up to the Ford brain, it won't do it. It won't do it. But Ford knows how to fix and repair Ford knows what is best for a Ford. Jaguar knows what's best for a Jag. Jesus, the creator, knows what's best for us. And so when we say to Christ, yes, and then talk to him, Christ says, I'm a God that is your friend. You know, it's interesting how all these religious right leaders are proud to be able to pick up the phone and call President Bush. They brag about it. James Dobson says, I have his personal number right here in my cell phone. He can hit a button and there it is. She's okay, Mark. Don't worry. She's sitting down. She's all right. James Dobson says, hey, you know what? I can hit a number and Bush will pick up the phone. That's power. Brothers and sisters, that's the access we have to the creator. That's the kind of power. And we don't have to worry about a drop call. You never have to say, can you hear me now, Lord? Have mercy. Raising the bar. Isn't that funny? No, God not only hears, but he anticipates what's coming. Why? And God says, your connection is so strong with me. The tower has so much power and, 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 and so, much, so, so, so much authority that before you ask, I will answer. And while you are yet speaking, I will hear. That's what God says. And so God, the creator, says, let me explain why. Lord, I just got to marry this woman. God says, leave her alone. You say, okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. And then you say, Lord, but wow, she reads the Bible. I've observed she's at the meetings every night. She does Bible studies. She dresses so modestly. She's so nice. And then the Lord says, yes, son, but that one's not for you. Let me show you some things. And the Lord will show you some things about yourself that would turn that woman into a monster. You say, oh, Lord, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, see, that, that chemistry, see, I created the rib that'll fit you. And then to some people, he says, you know what? There's no rib for you, so I'm going to be the rib because my God shall supply all my needs. He doesn't have to leave you, nor does he ever leave you dependent on somebody else to make you happy or bring joy. He fulfills all things in his own. So when you're running around thinking you need something else, it's because you have not adequately surrendered to God. Adam was not running around looking for a spouse. Yeah, these people say that he looked at the, at, 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 at the cow and the cow had a bull. And he looked, no, 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 he looked at that and appreciated it. It was all beautiful to him. And it was all good. He said, go to sleep, Adam. 
Adam wasn't running around saying, Lord, what about for me? No, he was complete in Christ. His mind was total in Christ. And so what we have to do, brothers and sisters, what we have to do tonight, what we must do is learn how to agree with God. Agree with God immediately, immediately agree. When God shows us something immediately, and when we find ourselves in sin, we know that the covers now have come off. The covering is an in and out experience. In other words, you say yes to God tonight, you go get in your car, and you turn on Power 106. God just left. You say yes to God tonight, and you're in Christ, and you go home, and rather than pouring that stuff out, you pop it and drink it. Rather than saying, Lord, I accept your victory over this, and he will help you pour it out, or he will help you change, this, change the station. Whatever it is in life, when you are covered, you have the right to go back to that old life. And when you go back to the old life, you are not only in trouble, but the Bible says very clearly that seven times as many demons take control of you. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 12. Then I want to show you some of the power and some of the help. And then I want to close. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 12. Brothers and sisters, Jesus desires to keep us from falling. He doesn't desire that we keep going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. God wants us to experience the blotting out of sins. But some of us, we don't let him get to that point. Some of us, we refuse to allow God to have the real authority that he wants and desires in our life. And brothers and sisters, I need to tell you something. There was a man that was taken into the councils where he said that he saw Satan in a meeting with his demons. And he was frustrated. And he started saying, we need to come up with some ways to offset humanity so that we could secure more souls than we have. We want them all. What can we do? One demon put his hand up because they respect him. They said, I know what we could do. Let's tell them that the law of God has been abolished. Let's tell them they don't have to pay attention to God's law anymore. Satan said, no, that, that won't work. All through the Bible, the scriptures that support the law of God. It won't work. The devil became agitated. Someone came up with another idea. He became more agitated. Another idea. He became more agitated. See, Satan is hellish in his fury. L let me show you something real quickly. Look at your paper here. Look at your paper. I want to show you what a prophetess saw. We'll come back to the Bible. Notice what it says. Notice what it says here in, uh, in the second paragraph before the end of the front page. Th 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 this is this this is what this is what 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 the prophetess saw when she was shown the devil. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. It says, "I was shown Satan as he once was, a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown him." As he now is, he still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble, for he is an angel fallen. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care, unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. All this could be seen in his countenance. That brow which was once so noble... I particularly noticed his forehead commenced from his eyes to recede. I saw that he had so long bent himself to evil that every good quality was debased and every evil trait was developed. This is what he wants to do to you. His eyes were cunning, sly, and showed great penetration. His frame was large. But the flesh hung loosely about his hands and face. As I beheld him, his chin was resting upon his left hand. He appeared to be in deep thought. A smile was upon his countenance, which made me tremble. 
It was so full of evil and satanic slyness. This smile is the one he wears just before he makes sure of his victim. And as he fastens the victim in his snare, this smile grows horrible. Devil is real. Listen, he's not a plaything. And that last demon, after so many demons gave their remarks, the devil was so mad and angry. And I can imagine this horrible smile on his face as he wanted to know something that would work to destroy humanity. And finally, the devil said, I know what to do. This is what we'll do to get him. Go out and tell all of them that they have plenty of time. Go tell them. Go tell them. And I am sad to announce tonight that it is working. I am sad to have to stand before you under the anointing of God and tell you that it is working. The people of God who are closest to God believe that they have plenty of time when the devil himself knows that he has but a short time. His time has run out. It's over, brothers and sisters. We're not living on borrowed time. It's midnight. The second hand is about to hit it. And when it hits, the irrevocable judgments of God are going to fall upon this earth and mercy will no more be seen. If you are not settled in Christ, if your sins are not blotted out, you will be lost. You can't go home and do what you did earlier today. You cannot continue because what happens is the same way. The devil educated his mind to be totally evil. That's what happens to you. See, the more you practice saying no to God, the more you become seared or the more you settle into the ways and means of Satan himself. God wants to free you tonight. I said God wants to free you tonight. He said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Tonight, God wants you to settle things with him. He wants your fleshly mind to be dead. He wants all your antics to be stopped. He doesn't want you to sit here and try to figure it out. He wants you to surrender to him. And if you find yourself figuring it out, guess what? Then you're not dead. If you find yourself figuring it out, you are not dead. You are alive. There have been many people who have been counted or announced as dead, but they were still alive. There have been stories where people have been placed in the body bag, zipped up and taken to the morgue, and they have heard something in the freezer, and they opened it, and the man was sitting there trembling with his eyes open. God didn't bring him back. He wasn't dead. He was yet alive. And too often, the devil has manipulated the death experience in us to allow us to think we're dead when we're alive. We're not in agreement with God. Even when we make decisions tonight, many of us are not in agreement with God. And we make the decision so hastily. We make it so quickly. And that's why the minute you come out of here, there's movement in the flesh again. You have to give up. You see, I'll close with this thought, and I'm going to pick up. I'm going to pick up tomorrow night right here. But I want to close with this thought. You see what happens, brothers and sisters. What happens is you said yes to Christ, and you started settling down into Christ. When you step outside of Christ, it doesn't mean that you will necessarily go back to all the things you used to do. Let me repeat that. When you are in Christ and his humanity is now operating and your humanity is dead. When you are in Christ and his divinity, his divine minds are giving you principles 
while you're dead. And you say yes to him, yes to him, yes to him, and you start settling down. The minute you say no to him and you step back outside, the minute you say no to him, brother, the minute you say no to him, the minute you say no, and you step back outside, even though all the sins prior to that point are back on your charge, are back on your plate. You follow me? It doesn't mean you'll start participating in them again. In other words, there are people who leave Christ that never start smoking again. There are people who leave Christ that never start cursing again. Even though those sins will show up in the judgment and they will be lost behind them. They may never participate in them again. And so what happens is the devil, because we have some of these apparently stronger victories still in our life, will make us think that we're still walking with God when we're not. And he deceives us. He deceives us. We have to move beyond because what happens is if we are not being sealed by God, we are being seared by Satan. And remember, demonic power is in charge of demonic thought. And so demonic power, Satan will command and commission his demon to leave you alone on points of victory that you thought were evidence of you being in Christ. Let me back up and say that again. Satan will tell those demons, this is a real war. This isn't, this isn't a pretend war. This isn't an accident. No, there are real demons that are alive and present. And because you don't see them and because they're not in front of you, you think it's a human pulling the trigger. Demons are behind death. Satan is constantly plotting every single minute to take your life. Bullets don't accidentally hit people. The devil, he's behind the man trying to make that crack so potent that your heart busts when you hit that pipe. Lord, I thank you right now. I'm not playing, brothers and sisters. Hey, a thought flashed through my I've seen them drop when I hit that pipe. I've seen them hit it, get that blast, and drop. Boom. And guess what? Everybody around the table, so demon-possessed, we don't call the emergency anything. He's dropped, and we, 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 we waiting, waiting for our blast devil wants to kill you desperately wants to kill you he wants you to be interested in everything but that which is godly he wants you to worship something other than God because he knows that you'll be lost and so what he does is he tells that he tells his 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 demons he says listen don't let Lewis ever have an urge to smoke crack anymore let him look at cool filter kings and like say Psh, and I don't know how I ever touched those. And let him believe that he's with me because he doesn't smoke anymore. You see, we have certain victories that, that, that we, we esteem. And if we were to put trophies based on victories on the mantle, some would be big and others would be small. But the wages of sin, singular is death. You big and bad, I'm telling you, I'm going to find that boy. You know that, 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 that ice cube talking about if, you, if you're scared, go to church. I say, if you're scared, stay in the hip-hop world. If you're scared, keep manipulating women. If you're scared, be a big hip-hop artist that won't walk around by itself. That's scared. Amen. I came up here with me and my little 10-year-old son. I didn't have to have no bunch of, bunch of wanksters around me. I'm going to sit around and make a popular song teaching our young people that if a person goes to church, he's some kind of a wimp. You better read your Bible, Ice Cube. Better read about the disciples. Well, no wimps, please. They were ready to fight, but God said, you don't have to fight. Don't you know that I could call upon my father and he'll send legions of angels right now? Just slow your roll, partner. Amen. In this warfare, there is no big or little sin when it comes to death. Now, you will be destroyed if you hang on to sin and those who commit certain sins 
will have greater punishments. In other words, a child molester will not get the same punishment as the man who just smiled and bowed down to Buddha all his life. The man who stole candy out the store, the Bible says that's not steal. It's, it's sin. He keeps doing it. He's not going to burn for stealing candy the, man, the way a rapist would burn. But the candy stealing would cost the death of Christ. How do I know it? Because Eve bit a piece of fruit a healthy piece of fruit, a piece of fruit that was not even destructive. Nothing was wrong with that fruit, except God said, don't touch it. God does not, is not the producer or the originator of poison. Satan is. He's the one that uh, originated food poisoning and all these other things that, that, that we get now, E. coli and all these other dangerous germs and viruses. That's the devil. God created that apple. And that apple was perfectly nutritious. And even today, now that you can eat it, you need to try to eat one every day because it does a whole lot for your body. But the devil wants you to believe that you're dead when you're alive. Or he wants you to believe that a half-hearted commitment, even, even one-third, even if you could get to the point where there's just one thing that you disagree on, just one. The Bible says in James chapter 2, and we began in that chapter tonight, beginning with verse 10, for if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you are guilty of all. We have to surrender everything to God, for this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, not one, not two, all of them. For the devil, the Bible says, the dragon is angry with the church or with the people of God who keep God's commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible says, if any man says that he cannot, that you don't have to obey the commandments, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. Over and over and over, the Bible tells us that only righteousness, complete surrender, will prevail. That surrender must come.